Before we begin to set forth the words of this conference held with that excellent man, Abbot Theonas, I think it well to describe in brief discourse the origin of his conversion, because from this the reader will be able to see more clearly both the excellence and the grace of the man. He then, while still very young, was by the desire and command of his parents joined in the tie of marriage. For as with pious anxiety they were careful about his chastity, and were afraid of a critical fall at a dangerous age, they thought that the passions of youth might be anticipated by the remedy of a lawful marriage. When then he had lived for five years with a wife, he came to Abbot John, who was then for his marvellous sanctity chosen to preside over the administration of the alms. For it is not any one who likes who is of his own wish or ambition promoted to this office, but only he whom the congregation of all the elders considers from the advantage of his age and the witness of his faith and virtues to be more excellent than and superior to all others. To this blessed John, then, the aforesaid young man had come in the eagerness of his pious devotion, bringing gifts of piety among other owners who were eager to offer tithes and firstfruits of their substance to the old man I mentioned, and when the old man saw them pouring in upon him with many gifts, and was anxious to make some recompense in return for their offerings, he began, as the apostle says, to sow spiritual things to them, whose carnal gifts he was reaping, and finally thus began his word of exhortation. I am indeed delighted, my children, with the duteous liberality of your gifts and your devout offering, the disposal of which is entrusted to me, I gratefully accept, because you are offering your first fruits and tithes for the good and use of the needy, as a sacrifice to the Lord of a sweet-smelling savour, in the belief that, by the offering of them, the abundance of your fruits and all your substance, from which you have taken away these for the Lord, will be richly blessed, and that you yourselves will, according to the faith of his command, be endowed, even in this world, with manifold richness in all good things. Honor the Lord from thy righteous labors, and offer to him of the fruits of thy righteousness, that thy garners may be full of abundance of wheat, and thy vats may overflow with wine. And as you are faithfully carrying out this service, you may know that you have fulfilled the righteousness of the old law, under which those who then lived, if they transgressed it, inevitably incurred guilt, while if they fulfilled it, they could not attain to a pitch of perfection. For indeed by the Lord's command, tithes were consecrated to the service of the Levites, but oblations and firstfruits for the priests. But this was the law of the firstfruits, namely that the fiftieth part of fruits or animals should be given for the service of the temple and the priests. And this proportion some who were faithlessly indifferent diminished, while those who were very religious increased it, so that the one gave only the sixtieth part, and the other gave the fortieth part of their fruits. For the righteous, for whom the law is not enacted, are thus shown to be not under the law, as they try not only to fulfill, but even to exceed the righteousness of the law. And their devotion is greater than the legal requirements, as it goes beyond the observance of precepts, and adds to what is due of its own free will. For so we read that Abraham went beyond the requirement of the law which was afterwards to be given, when after his victory over the four kings, he would not touch any of the spoils of Sodom, which were fairly due to him as the conqueror, and which indeed the king himself, whose spoils he had rescued, offered him. And with an oath by the divine name he exclaimed, I lift up my hand to the Lord Most High, who made heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread to a shoe's latchet of all that is thine. So we know that David went beyond the requirement of the law, as though Moses commanded that vengeance should be taken on enemies. He not only did not do this, but actually embraced his persecutors with love, and piously entreated the Lord for them, and wept bitterly, and avenged them when they were slain. 
So we are sure that Elijah and Jeremiah were not under the law, as though they might without blame have taken advantage of lawful matrimony, yet they preferred to remain virgins. So we read that Elijah and others of the same mode of life went beyond the commands of Moses, as of them the apostle speaks as follows. They went about in sheepskins and in goatskins. They were oppressed, afflicted, in want, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered about in deserts and in mountains, and in caves and in dens of the earth. What shall I say of the sons of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, of whom we are told that, when at the Lord's bidding the prophet Jeremiah offered them wine, they replied, We drink no wine. For Jonadab the son of Rechab our father commanded us, saying, Ye shall drink no wine, ye and your sons for ever, and ye shall build no house, nor sow any seed, nor plant vineyards, nor possess them. But ye shall dwell in tents all your days. Wherefore also they were permitted to hear from the same prophet these words, Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, There shall not fail a man from the stock of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, to stand in my sight all the days, as all of them are not satisfied with merely offering tithes of their possessions, but actually refused property, and offered the rather to God themselves and their souls, for which no redemption can be made by man, as the Lord testifies in the gospel. For what shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? Wherefore we ought to know that we from whom the requirements of the law are no longer exacted, but in whose ears the word of the gospel daily sounds. If thou art be perfect, go and sell all that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And when we offer to God tithes of our sustenance, we still in a way go down beneath the burden of the law, and not abide to rise to those heights of the gospel, those who conform to which are recompensed not only by blessings in this present life, but also by future rewards. For the law promises to those who obey it no rewards of the kingdom of heaven, but only solaces in this life, saying, The man that doeth these things shall live in them. But the Lord says to his disciples, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And everyone that leaveth his house, or brothers, or mothers, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or field for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall inherit eternal life. And this with good reason. For it is not so praiseworthy for us to abstain from forbidden as from lawful things, and not to use these last out of reverence for him, who has permitted us to use them because of our weakness. And if so, even those who, faithfully offering tithes of their fruits, are obedient to the more ancient precepts of the Lord, cannot yet climb the heights of the gospel. You can see very clearly how far short of it those fall who do not even do this. For how can those men be partakers of the grace of the gospel who disregard the fulfillment even of the lighter commands of the law, to the easy character of which the weighty words of the giver of the law bear testimony, as a curse is actually invoked on those who do not fulfill them. For it says, Cursed is everyone that does not continue in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. But here, on account of the superiority and excellence of the commandments, it is said, He that can receive it, let him receive it. There the forcible compulsion of the lawgiver shows the easy character of the precepts, for he says, I call heaven and earth to record against you this day, that if ye do not keep the commandments of the Lord your God, ye shall perish from off the face of the earth. Here the grandeur of sublime commands is shown by the very fact that he does not order, but exhorts, saying, If thou wilt be perfect, go, and do this or that. There Moses lays a burden that cannot be refused on those who are unwilling. Here Paul meets with counsels, those who are willing and eager for perfection. 
for that was not to be enjoined as a general charge, nor to be required, if I may so say, as a regular rule from all, which could not be secured by all, owing to its wonderful and lofty nature. But by counsels all are rather stimulated to grace, that those who are great may deservedly be crowned by the perfection of their virtues, while those who are small, and not able to come up to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, although they seem to be lost to sight and hidden, as it were, by the brightness of larger stars, may yet be free from the darkness of the curses which are in the law, and not adjudged to suffer present evils or visited with eternal punishment. Christ, therefore, does not constrain anyone by the compulsion of a command to those lofty heights of goodness, but stimulates them by the power of free will, and urges them on by wise counsels and the desire of perfection. For where there is a command, there is duty, and consequently punishment. But those who keep those things to which they are driven by the severity of the law established, escape the punishment with which they were threatened, instead of obtaining rewards and a recompense. And as the word of the gospel raises those that are strong to sublime and lofty heights, so it suffers not the weak to be dragged down to the depths, for it secures to the perfect the fullness of blessing, and brings to those who are overcome through weakness pardon. For the law placed those who fulfilled its commands in a sort of middle state between what they deserved in either case severing them from the condemnation due to transgressors, as it also kept them away from the glory of the perfect. But how wretched and miserable this is! You can see from comparing the state of this present life, in which it is considered a very poor thing for a man to sweat and labor, only to avoid being regarded as guilty among good men, not also to be esteemed rich and honorable and renowned. Wherefore it lies today in our own power whether we choose to live under the grace of the gospel or under the terrors of the law. For each man must incline to one side or to the other in accordance with the character of his actions. For either the grace of Christ welcomes those who are beyond the law, or else the law keeps its hold over the weaker ones as those who are its debtors and within its clutches. For one who is guilty as regards the precepts of the law will never be able to attain to the perfection of the gospel, even though he idly boasts that he is a Christian and freed by the Lord's grace. For we must not only regard as still under the law the man who refuses to fulfill what the law enjoins, but the man as well who is satisfied with the mere observance of what the law commands, and who never brings forth fruits worthy of his vocation and the grace of Christ, where it is not said, Thou shalt offer to the Lord thy God thy tithes and first fruits, but go and sell all that thou hast, and give to the poor, and come follow me, where, owing to the grandeur of perfection, to the request of the disciple, there is not granted even the very short space of an hour in which to bury his father, as the offices of divine charity are outweighed by the virtue of divine love. And when he had heard this, the blessed Theones was fired with an uncontrollable desire for the perfection of the gospel, and committed, as it were, the seed of the word, which he had received in a fruitful heart, to the deep and broken furrows of his bosom, as he was greatly humiliated and conscience-stricken, because the old man had said not only that he had failed to attain to the perfection of the gospel, but also that he had scarcely fulfilled the commands of the law, since though he was accustomed every year to pay the tithes of his fruits as alms, yet he mourned that he had never even heard of the law of the first fruits, and even if he had in the same way fulfilled this, he humbly confessed that still he would in the old man's view have been very far from the perfection of the gospel. And so he returned home sad, and filled with that sorrow which worketh repentance unto salvation, and of his own will and determination 
turns all his wife's cares and anxiety of mind toward salvation, and began to stir her up to the same eager desire with which he himself had been inflamed, with the same sort of exhortations, and with tears, day and night, to urge her that together they might serve God in sanctity and chastity, telling her that their conversion to a better life ought not to be deferred, because a vain hope in their youth would be no argument against the inevitableness of a sudden death, which carries off boys and youth, and young persons equally with old men. And when his wife was hard, and would not consent to him, as he constantly persisted with entreaties of this kind, but said that, as she was in the flower of her age, she could not altogether do without the solace of her husband, and further, that, supposing she was deserted by him and fell into sin, the guilt would rather be his, who had broken the bonds of wedlock. To this he, when he had for a long while urged the condition of human nature, which, being so weak and uncertain, it would be dangerous for it to be any longer mixed up with carnal desires and works, added the assertion that it was not right for anyone to cut himself off from the virtue to which he had learnt, that he ought by all means to cleave, and that it was more dangerous to disregard goodness when discovered than to fail to love it before it was discovered. Further, that he was already involved in the guilt of a fall if, when he had discovered such grand and heavenly blessings, he had preferred earthly and mean ones. Further, that the grandeur of perfection was open to every age and either sex, and that all the members of the church were urged to scale the heights of heavenly goodness when the apostle said, So run that ye may obtain. Nor should those who were ready and eager for it hang back because of the delays of the slow and dawdlers, as it is better for the sluggards to be urged on by those running before than for those who are doing their best to be hampered by the slothful. Further, that he had determined and made up his mind to renounce the world and to die to the world, that he might live to God, and that if he could not attain this happiness, namely to pass with his wife into union with Christ, he would rather be saved, even with the loss of one member, and enter into the kingdom of heaven as one maimed, rather than be condemned with his body whole. But he also added and spoke as follows, If Moses suffered wives to be divorced for the hardness of their hearts, why should not Christ allow this for the desire of chastity, especially when the same Lord among those other affections, namely for fathers and mothers and children, all due regard to which not only the law but he himself also charged to be shown, yet for his name's sake and for the desire of perfection he decreed that they should not simply be disregarded but actually hated. To these I say, he joined also the mention of wives, saying, And every one that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall inherit eternal life. So far then is he from allowing anything to be set against that perfection which he is proclaiming, that he actually enjoins that the ties to father and mother should be broken, and disregarded out of love for him, though, according to the Apostle, it is the first commandment with promise, namely, Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it went well with thee, and that thy days may be long upon earth. And as the word of the gospel condemns those who break the chains of matrimony, where there has been no sin of adultery, so it clearly promises a reward of an hundredfold to those who have cast off a carnal yoke out of love for Christ and the desire for chastity. Wherefore, if it can be brought about that you may listen to reason, be turned together with me to this most desirable choice, namely that we should together serve the Lord and escape the pains of hell, I will not refuse the affection of marriage, nay, I will embrace it with a still greater love. For I acknowledge and honor my helpmeet assigned to me by the word of the Lord, and I do not refuse to be joined to her in an unbroken tie of love in Christ, 
nor do I separate from me what the Lord joined to me by the law of the original condition. If only you yourself will be what your Maker meant you to be. But if you will not be a helpmeet, but prefer to make yourself a deceiver and an assistance, not to me, but to the adversary, and fancy that the sacrament of matrimony was granted to you for this reason, that you may deprive yourself of this salvation which is offered to you, and also hold me back from following the Savior as a disciple, then I will resolutely lay hold on the words which were uttered by the lips of Abbot John, or rather of Christ himself, so that no carnal affection may be able to tear me away from spiritual blessings. For he says, He that hateth not father or mother and children, and brothers and sisters and wife and lands, yea, and his own soul also, cannot be my disciple. When then by these and such like words the woman's purpose was not moved, and she persisted in the same obstinate hardness, If, said the blessed Theonas, I cannot drag you away from death, neither shall you separate me from Christ, but it is safer for me to be divorced from a human person than from God. And so by the aid of God's grace he at once set about the execution of his purpose and suffered not the ardor of a desire to grow cold through any delay. For at once he stripped himself of all his worldly goods and fled to a monastery, where in a very short time he was so famous for the splendor of his sanctity and humility that when John of blessed memory departed this life to the Lord, and the holy Elias, a man who was no less great than his predecessor, had likewise died, Theonas was chosen by the judgment of all as the third to succeed them in the administration of the almsgiving. But let no one imagine that we have invented this for the sake of encouraging divorce, as we not only in no way condemn marriage, but also following the words of the apostles say, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bled undefiled. But it was in order faithfully to show the reader that origin of the conversion by which this great man was dedicated to God. And I ask the reader kindly to allow that, whether he likes this or no, in either case I am free from blame, and to give the praise or blame for this act to its real author. But as for me, as I have not put forward an opinion of mine own on this matter, but have given a simple narration of the history of the facts, it is fair that, as I claim no praise from those who approve of what was done, so I should not be attacked by the hatred of those who disapprove of it. Let every man, therefore, as we said, have his own opinion on the matter. But I advise him to restrain his censure in considering it, lest he come to fancy that he is more just and holy than the divine judgment, whereby the signs, even of apostolic virtue, were conferred upon him, namely Theonas. Not to mention the opinion of such great fathers, of whom it is clear that his action was not only not blamed, but even so far praised, that in the election to the office of almoner, they preferred him to splendid and most excellent men. And I fancy that the judgment of so many spiritual men, uttered with God as its author, was not wrong, as it was, as was said above, confirmed by such wonderful signs. But it is now time to follow out the plan of the promised discourse. So then, when Abbot Theonas had come to visit us in our cell during Eastertide, after evensong was over, we sat for a little while on the ground and began diligently to consider why they were so very careful that no one should during the whole fifty days either bend his knees in prayer or venture to fast till the ninth hour. And we made our inquiry the more earnestly, because we had never seen this custom so carefully observed in the monasteries of Syria. To this Abbot Theonas thus began his reply. It is indeed right for us, even when we cannot see the reason, to yield to the authority of the fathers, and to a custom of our predecessors that has been continued through so many years down to our own time, and to observe it, as handed down from antiquity, with constant care and reverence. 
But since you want to know the reasons and grounds for this, receive in a few words what we have heard as handed down by our elders on this subject. But before we bring forward the authority of Holy Scripture, we will, if you please, say a little about the nature and character of the fast, that afterwards the authority of Holy Scripture may support our words. The divine wisdom has pointed out in Ecclesiastes that for everything, that is, for all things happy or those which are considered unfortunate and unhappy, there is a right time, saying, For all things there is a time, and a time for everything under the heaven, a time to bring forth and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pull down what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to destroy and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get and a time to loose, a time to keep and a time to send away, a time to scatter and a time to collect, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. And below, for there is a time, it says, for everything and for every deed. None, therefore, of these things does it lay down as always good, but only when any of them are fittingly done and at the right time, so that these very things which are at one time, when done at the right moment, turn out well, if they are ventured on at a wrong or unsuitable time, are found to be useless or harmful, only excepting those things which are in their own nature good or bad, and which cannot ever be made the opposite, as, for example, justice, prudence, fortitude, temperance, and the rest of the virtues, or, on the other hand, those faults, the description of which cannot possibly be altered or fall under the other head. But those things which can sometimes turn out with either result, so that, in accordance with the character of those who use them, they are found to be either good or bad. These we consider to be not absolutely in their own natures useful or injurious, but only so in accordance with the mind of the doer and the suitableness of the time. Wherefore, we must now inquire what we ought to hold about the state of fasting, whether we meant that it was in the same sort of way as justice, prudence, fortitude, and temperance, which cannot possibly be made anything else, or whether it is something indifferent, which sometimes is useful when done, and may be sometimes omitted without condemnation, and which sometimes it is wrong to do, and sometimes laudable to omit. For if we hold fasting to be included in that list of virtues, so that abstinence from food is placed among those things which are good in themselves, then certainly the partaking of food will be bad and wrong. For whatever is the opposite of that which is in its own nature good, must certainly be held to be in its own nature bad. But this the authority of Holy Scripture does not allow to us to lay down. For if we fast with such thoughts and intentions, so as to think that we fall into sin by taking food, we shall not only gain no advantage by our abstinence, but shall actually contract grievous guilt and fall into the sin of impiety, as the Apostle says, abstaining from meats which God has created to be received with thanksgiving by the faithful and those who know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it is partaken of with thanksgiving. For, if a man thinks that a thing common, to him it is common. And therefore we never read that anyone is condemned simply for taking food, but only when something was joined with it, or followed afterwards, for which he deserved condemnation. And so that it is a thing indifferent is very clearly shown from this also, 
namely, because as it brings justification when observed, so it does not bring condemnation when it is broken in upon, unless perhaps the transgression of a command, rather than the partaking of food, brings punishment. But in the case of a thing that is good in its own nature, no time should be without it, in such a way as that a man may do without it. For if it ceases, the man who is careless about it is sure to fall into mischief. Nor again is any time given for what is bad in its own nature, because what is hurtful cannot help hurting, if it is indulged in, nor can it ever be made of a praiseworthy character. And further, it is clear that these things, for which we see conditions and times appointed, and which sanctify, when observed without corrupting us, when they are neglected, are things indifferent, as, example, marriage, agriculture, riches, retirement into the desert, vigils, reading, and meditation on Holy Scripture, and fasting itself, from which our discussion took its rise. All of which things the divine precepts and the authority of Holy Scripture decreed should not be so incessantly aimed at, or so constantly observed, as for it to be wrong for them to be for a time intermitted. For anything that is absolutely commanded brings death if it be not fulfilled. But whatever things we are urged to, rather than commanded, when done are useful, when left undone bring no punishment. And therefore in the case of all or some of these things, our predecessors commanded us either to do them with consideration or to observe them carefully with regard to the reason, place, manner, and time, because if any of them are done suitably, it is fit and convenient, but if incongruously, then it becomes foolish and hurtful. And if at the coming of a brother, in whose person he ought to refresh Christ with courtesy, and to embrace him with a most kindly welcome, a man should choose to observe a strict fast, would he not rather be guilty of incivility than gain the praise or reward of devoutness? Or if, when the failure of weakness of the flesh requires the strength to be restored by the partaking of food, a man will not consent to relax the rigor of his abstinence? Is he not to be regarded as a cruel murderer of his own body, rather than as one who is careful for his salvation? So too, when a festival season permits a suitable indulgence in food, and a necessarily liberal repast, if a man will resolutely cling to the strict observance of a fast, he must be considered as not religious so much as boorish and unreasonable. But to those men also will these things be found bad, who are on the lookout for the praises of men by their fasts, and by a foolish show of paleness gain credit for sanctity, of whom the word of the gospel tells us that they have received their reward in this life, and whose fast the Lord execrates by the prophet, in whose person he first objected to himself and said, Wherefore have we fasted, and thou hast not regarded? Wherefore have we humbled our souls, and thou hast not known it? And then at once he answered and explained the reasons why they did not deserve to be heard. Behold, he says, in the days of your fast your own will is found, and you exact of all your debtors. Behold, you fast for debates and strife, and strike with the fist wickedly. Do not fast as ye have done unto this day, to make your cry to be heard on high. Is this such a fast as I have chosen, for a man to afflict his soul for a day? Is it this, to wind his head about like a circle, and to spread sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, and a day acceptable to the Lord? Then he proceeds to teach how the abstinence of one who fasts may become acceptable, and clearly lays down that fasting cannot be good of itself alone, but only when it has the following reasons which are added. Is not this, he says, the fast that I have chosen? Loose the bands of wickedness, undo the bundles that oppress, let them that are broken go free, and break asunder every burden. 
deal thy bread to the hungry, and bring the needy and the harborless into thine house. And when thou shalt see one naked, cover him, and despise not thine own flesh. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thy health shall speedily arise, and thy righteousness shall go before thy face, and the glory of the Lord shall gather thee up. Then thou shalt call, and the Lord shall hear. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here am I. You see then that fasting is certainly not considered by the Lord as a thing that is good in its own nature, because it becomes good and well-pleasing to God, not by itself, but by other works. And again from the surrounding circumstances, it may be regarded as not merely vain, but actually hateful. As the Lord says, When they fast, I will not hear their prayers. For we ought not to practice pity, patience, and love, and the precepts of the virtues mentioned above, wherein there is what is good in its own nature, for the sake of fasting, but rather fasting for the sake of them. For our endeavor must be that those virtues which are really good may be gained by fasting, not that the practice of those virtues may lead to fasting as its end. For this, then, the affliction of the flesh is useful. For this, the remedy of abstinence must be employed, namely, that by it we may succeed in attaining to love, wherein there is what is good without change, and continually with no exception of time. For medicines, and the goldsmith's art, and the systems of other arts, which there are in this world, are not employed for the sake of the instruments which belong to the particular work, but rather the implements are prepared for the practice of the art. And as they are useful for those who understand them, so they are useless to those who are ignorant of the system of the art in question. And as they are a great help to those who rely on their aid for doing their work, so they cannot be of the smallest use to those who do not know for what purpose they were made, and are contented simply with the possession of them, because they make all their value consist in the mere having of them, and not in the performance of work. That, then, is in its own nature the best thing, for the sake of which things indifferent are done. But the very chiefest good is done not for the sake of anything else, but because of its own intrinsic goodness." And this may be distinguished from those other things which we have termed indifferent in these ways. If a thing is good in itself, and not by reason of something else, if it is useful for its own sake, and not for the sake of something else, if it is unchangeably and at all times good, and always keeps its character and can never become anything different, if its removal or cessation cannot fail to produce the greatest harm, if that which is its opposite is in the same way evil in its own nature, and can never be turned into anything good. And these descriptions by which the nature of things that are good in themselves can be distinguished cannot possibly be applied to fasting, for it is not good of itself, nor useful for its own sake, because it is widely used for the acquisition of purity of heart and body, that the pricks of the flesh being dulled, the soul may be pacified and reconciled to its Creator. Nor is it unchangeably and at all times good, because often we are injured by its intermission, and indeed sometimes if it is unreasonably practiced, it becomes injurious. Nor is that which seems its opposite evil in its own nature, that is, the partaking of food, which is naturally agreeable, which cannot be regarded as evil, unless intemperance and luxury or some other faults are the result. For not that which entereth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, that defileth a man. And so a man disparages what is good in its own nature, and does not treat it properly or without sin, if he does it not for its own sake, but for the sake of something else. For everything else should be done for the sake of it, but it should be sought for its own sake alone. So then let us constantly remember this description of the character of fasting, 
and always aim at it with all the powers of the soul in such a way as to recognize that then only it is suitable for us, if in it we preserve regard for time, its character and degree, and this not so as to set the end of our hope upon it, but so that by it we may succeed in attaining to purity of heart and apostolical love. Therefore from this it is clear that fasting, for which not only are there special seasons appointed, at which it should be practiced or relaxed, but conditions and rules also laid down, it is not good in its own nature, but something indifferent. But those things which are either enjoined as good by the authority of a precept, or are forbidden as bad, are never subject to any exceptions of time in such a way that sometimes we should do what is forbidden or omit what is commanded. For there is no limit set to justice, patience, soberness, modesty, love, nor, on the other hand, is a license ever granted for injustice, impatience, wrath, immodesty, envy, and pride. Wherefore, as we have premised this on the conditions of fasting, it seems well to subjoin the authority of Holy Scripture, by which it will be more clearly proved that fasting neither can nor should be always observed. In the Gospel, when the Pharisees were fasting together with the disciples of John the Baptist, as the apostles, as friends and companions of the heavenly bridegroom, were not yet keeping the observance of a fast, the disciples of John, who thought that they acquired perfect righteousness by their fasts, as they were followers of that grand preacher of repentance, who afforded a pattern to all the people by his own example, as he not only refused the different kinds of food which are supplied for man's use, but actually altogether did without eating the bread which is common to all, complained to the Lord and said, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but thy disciples fast not? To whom the Lord, in his reply, plainly showed that fasting is not suitable or necessary at all times, when any festival season or opportunity for love intervenes, and permits an indulgence in food, saying, Can the children of the bridegroom mourn while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then they shall fast. Words which, although they were spoken before the resurrection of his body, yet specially point to the season of Eastertide, in which after his resurrection for forty days he ate with his disciples, and their joy in his daily presence did not allow them to fast. Germanus, why then do we relax the rigor of our abstinence in our meals all through the fifty days, whereas Christ only remained with his disciples for forty days after his resurrection? Your pertinent question deserves to be told the perfect true reason. After the ascension of our Savior, which took place on the fortieth day after the, his resurrection, the apostles returned from the Mount of Olives, on which he had suffered them to see him when he was returning to the Father, as the book of Acts of the Apostle also testifies, and entered Jerusalem, and are said to have waited ten days for the coming of the Holy Ghost. And when these were fulfilled on the fiftieth day, they received him with joy. And thus in this way the number of this festival was clearly made up, which, as we read, was figuratively foreshadowed also in the Old Testament where, when seven weeks were fulfilled, the bread of the firstfruits was ordered to be offered by the priests to the Lord. And this was indeed shown to be offered to the Lord by the preaching of the apostles, which they are said on that day to have addressed to the people. The true bread of the firstfruits, which, when produced from the instruction of a new doctrine, consecrated the firstfruits of the Jews as of Christian people to the Lord. 5,000 men being filled with the gifts of the food. And therefore these ten days are to be kept with equal solemnity and joy as the previous forty. And the tradition about this festival, transmitted to us by apostolic men, should be kept with the same uniformity. And therefore on those days they do not bow their knees in prayer, because the bending of the knees is a sign of penitence and mourning. 
Wherefore also these days we observe in all things the same solemnities as on Sunday, on which day our predecessors taught that men ought not to fast nor to bow the knee, out of reverence for the Lord's resurrection. Germanus, can the flesh, attracted by the unwanted luxuries of so long a festival, fail to produce something thorny from the incentives to sin, although they have been cut down? Or can the soul weighed down by the consumption of unaccustomed feasts fail to mitigate the rigor of its rule over its servant, the body, especially when, in our case, our mature age can excite our subject members to a speedy revolt, if we venture to take our usual food in larger quantities, or unaccustomed food more freely than usual? Theonas If we weigh everything that we do by a reasonable judgment of the mind, and on the purity of our heart, always consult not the opinions of other people, but our own conscience, that interval for refreshment is sure not to interfere with our proper strictness, if only, as we said, our pure mind impartially considers the right limits of indulgence and abstinence, and fairly checks excess in either, and with real discrimination discerns whether the weight of the delicacies is a burden upon our spirits, or whether too much austerity in abstaining weighs down the other side, that is, that of the body, and either depresses or raises that side which it sees to be raised or weighed down. For our Lord would have nothing done to his honor and glory without being tempered by judgment, for the honor of a king loveth judgment. And therefore Solomon, the wisest of men, urges us not to let our judgment incline to either side, saying, Honor God with thy righteous labors, and offer to him of the fruits of thy righteousness. For we have residing in our conscience an uncorrupt and true judge, who sometimes, when all are wrong, is the only person not deceived as to the state of our purity. And so with all care and pains, we should preserve a constant purpose in our circumspect heart, for fear, lest if the judgment of our discretion goes wrong, we may be fired with the desire for an ill-considered abstinence, or allured by the wish for an excessive relaxation, and so weigh the substance of our strength in the tongue of an unfair balance. But we should place in one of the scales our purity of soul, and in the other our bodily strength, and weigh them both in the true judgment of conscience, so that we may not perversely incline the scale of fairness to either side, either to undue strictness or to excessive relaxation, from the prepondering desire for one or the other. And so have this said to us by reason of excessive strictness or relaxation. If thou offerest rightly, but dost not divide rightly, hast thou not sinned? For those offerings of fasts, which we thoughtlessly extort by violently tearing our bowels, and fancy that we rightly offer to the Lord these execrates who loves mercy and judgment, saying, I the Lord love judgment, but I hate robbery and a burnt offering. Those also who take the main part of their offerings, that is, their offices and actions, to benefit the flesh for their own use, but leave the remains of them, and a tiny portion for the Lord. These the divine word thus condemns as fraudulent workmen. Cursed is he that doeth the work of the Lord fraudulently. It is not then without reason that the Lord reproves him, who thus deceives himself by unfair considerations, saying, But vain are the children of men. The children of men are liars upon the balances that they may deceive. And therefore the blessed apostle warns us to keep hold of the reins of discretion, and not to be attracted by excess and swerve to either side, saying, Your reasonable service. And the giver of the law similarly forbids the same thing, saying, Let the balance be just, and the weights equal, the bushel just, and the sectarius equal. And Solomon also gives a like opinion on this matter. 
great and small weights and double measures are both unclean before the Lord, and one who uses them shall be hindered in his contrivances. Further, not only in the way in which we have said, but also in this must we strive not to have unfair weights in our hearts, nor double measures in the storehouse of our conscience, that is, not to overwhelm those to whom we are to preach the word of the Lord, with precepts that are too strict and heavier than we ourselves can bear, while we take for granted that, for ourselves, those things which have to do with the rule of strictness are to be softened by a freer allowance of relaxation. For when we do this, what is it but to weigh and measure the goods and fruits of the Lord's commands in a double weight and measure? For if we dispense them in one way to ourselves, and in another to our brother, we are rightly blamed by the Lord because we have unfair balances and double measures, in accordance with the saying of Solomon, which tells us that a double weight is an abomination to the Lord, and a deceitful balance is not good in his sight. In this way also we plainly incur the guilt of using a deceitful weight and a double measure, if out of the desire for the praise of men we make a show before the brethren of greater strictness than what we practice in private in our own cells, trying to appear more abstinent and holier in the sight of men than in the sight of God, an evil which we should not only avoid, but actually loathe. But meanwhile, as we have wandered some way from the question before us, let us return to the point from which we started. So then, we should keep the observance of the days mentioned in such a way that the relaxation allowed may be useful rather than harmful to the good of body and soul, because the joy of any festival cannot blunt the pricks of the flesh, nor can the fierce enemy of ours be pacified by regard for days. In order then that the observance of the customs appointed for festival seasons may be kept, and that the most salutary rule of abstinence be not at all exceeded. It is enough for us to allow the permitted relaxation to go so far, as for us out of regard for the festival season to take the food, which ought to be taken at the ninth hour, a little earlier, namely at the sixth hour. But with this condition, that the regular allowance and character of the food be not altered, for fear lest the purity of body and uprightness of soul which has been gained by the abstinence of Lent be lost by the relaxation of Easter tide, and it profit us nothing to have acquired by our fast what a careless satiety causes us presently to lose, especially as the well-known cunning of our enemy assaults the stronghold of our purity, then chiefly when he sees that our guard over it is somewhat relaxed at the celebration of some festival. Wherefore we must most vigilantly look out that the vigor of our soul be never enervated by seductive flatteries, and we lose not the purity of our chastity gained, as we said, by the continuous efforts of Lent, by the repose and carelessness of Easter tide. And therefore no addition at all should be made to the quality or quantity of the food, but even on the highest festivals we should similarly abstain from those foods, by abstinence from which we preserve our uprightness on common days, that the joy of the festival may not excite in us a most deadly conflict of carnal desires, and so be turned to grief, and put an end to that most excellent festival of the heart, which exults in the joy of purity, and after a brief show of carnal joy, we begin to mourn our loss of purity of heart with a lasting sorrow of repentance." Moreover, we should strive that this warning of the prophetic exhortation may not be uttered against us to no purpose. Celebrate, O Judah, thy festivals, and pay thy vows. For if the occurrence of festival days does not interfere with the continuity of our abstinence, we shall continually enjoy spiritual festivals, and so, when we cease from servile work, there shall be month after month and Sabbath after Sabbath. Germanus. What is the reason why Lent is kept for six weeks, while in some countries a possibly more earnest care for religion seems to have added a seventh week as well, 
though neither number when you subtract Sunday and Saturday gives a total of 40 days, for only 6 and 30 days are included in these weeks. Theonas Although the pious simplicity of some folks would put aside a question on the subject, yet because you are more scrupulous in your examination of those things which another would consider unworthy to be asked about, and want to know the whole truth of this observance of ours, and the secret of it, you shall have a very clear answer for this also, that you may still more plainly be convinced that our predecessors taught nothing unreasonable. By the law of Moses, the command propounded to all the people generally was this, Thou shalt offer to the Lord thy God thy tithes and fruits. And so while we are commanded to offer tithes of our substance, and all our fruits, it is much more needful for us to offer tithes of our life and ordinary employments and actions, which certainly is clearly arranged for in the calculation of Lent. For the tithe of the number of all the days included in the revolving circle of the year is thirty-six days and half. But in seven weeks, if Sundays and Saturdays are subtracted, there remain thirty-five days assigned for fasting. But by the addition of Easter Eve, when the Saturday's fast is prolonged to the cock crowing at the dawn of Easter day, not only is the number of thirty-six days made up, but in regard to the tithe of the five days which seem to be over, if the bit of the night which was added be taken into account, nothing will be wanting to the whole sum. But what shall I say of the first fruits, which surely are given daily by all those who serve Christ faithfully? For when men waking from sleep, and arising with renewed activity after their rest, before they take in any impulse or thought in their heart, or admit any recollection or consideration of business, consecrate their first and earliest thoughts as divine offerings, what are they doing indeed, but rendering the first fruits of their produce through the high priest Christ Jesus for the enjoyment of this life and a figure of the daily resurrection. And also when roused from sleep, in the same way they offer to God a sacrifice of joy and invoke him with the first motion of their tongue and celebrate his name and praise, and throwing open the first thing, the door of their lips to sing hymns to him, they offer to God the offices of their mouth. And to him also, in the same way, they bring the earliest offerings of their hands and steps, when they rise from their bed and stand in prayer, and before they use the services of their limbs for their own purposes, take to themselves nothing of their services, but for his glory advance their steps, and set them in his praise, and so render the first fruits of all their movements by stretching forth the hands, bending the knees, and prostrating the whole body. For in no other way can we fulfill that of which we sing in the psalm. I prevented the dawning of the day and cried, and mine eyes to thee have prevented the morning that I might meditate on thy words, and in the morning shall my prayer prevent thee, unless after our rest in sleep when, as we said before, we are restored as from darkness and death to this light, we have the courage not to begin by taking any of all the services both of mind and body for our own uses. For there is no other morning in which the prophet prevented, or which in the same way we ought to prevent, except either ourselves, that is, our occupations and feelings and earthly cares, without which we cannot exist, or the most subtle suggestions of the adversary, which he tries to suggest to us, while still resting and overcome with sleep by the phantoms of vain dreams, with which, when we presently awake, he will fill our minds and occupy us, that he may be the first to seize and carry off the spoils of our first fruits. Wherefore we must take the utmost care, if we want to fulfill, in act the meaning of the above quoted verse, that an anxious watchfulness takes regard of our first and earliest morning thoughts, that they may not be defiled beforehand being hastily taken possession of by our jealous adversary, and thus he may take our first fruits to be rejected by the Lord as worthless and common. 
And if he is not prevented by us with watchful circumspection of mind, he will not lay aside his habit of miserably anticipating us, nor cease day after day to prevent us by his wiles. And therefore, if we want to offer first fruits that are acceptable and well pleasing to God of the fruits of our mind, we ought to spend no ordinary care to keep all our senses of our body, especially during the hours of the morning, as a sacred holocaust to the Lord, pure and undefiled in all things. And this kind of devotion may even of those who live in the world observe with the utmost care, as they rise before it is light or very early, and do not at all mix in the ordinary and necessary business of this world before hastening to church and striving to consecrate in the sight of God the first fruit of all their actions and doings. Further, as for what you say, namely, that in some countries Lent is kept in different ways, that is, for six or seven weeks, it is but one system and the same manner of the fast that is preserved by the different observance of the weeks. For those who think one ought to fast also on the Saturday have determined on the observance of six weeks. They therefore fast for six days out of the seven, and this being six times repeated makes up the six and thirty days. It is therefore, as we said, but one system and the same manner of the fast, although there seems to be a difference in the number of the weeks. But further, as man's carelessness dropped out of sight the reason of this, this season when, as was said, the tithes of the year are offered by fasts for thirty-six days and a half, was called quadradesima, a name which perhaps they thought ought to be given to it for this reason, namely that it was said that Moses and Elijah and our Lord Jesus Christ himself fasted for forty days. To the mystery of which number are not unsuitably applied those forty years in which Israel dwelt in the wilderness, and in like manner the forty stations which they are said to have passed through with a mystic meaning. Or perhaps the tithe was properly given the name Quadragesima from the use of the custom house. For so the state tax is commonly called, from which the same proportion of the increment is assigned for the king's use, as the legal tribute of quadragesima, which is required of us by the king of all the ages for the use of our life. At any rate, although this has nothing to do with the question raised, yet I think that I ought not to omit the fact that very often our elders used to testify that especially on these days the whole body of monks was attacked according to the ancient custom of the people opposed to them, and was more vehemently urged to forsake their homes. For this reason, because in accordance with this figure, whereby the Egyptians formerly oppressed the children of Israel with grievous afflictions, so now also the spiritual Egyptians try to bow down the true Israel, that is, the monastic folk, with hard and vile tasks, lest by means of that peace which is dear to God we should forsake the land of Egypt, and for our good, cross to the deserts of virtues, so that Pharaoh rages against us and says, They are idle, and therefore they cry, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to the Lord our God. Let them be oppressed with labors, and be harassed in their works, and they shall not be harassed by vain words. For certainly their folly imagines that the holy sacrifice of the Lord, which is only offered in the desert of a pure heart, is the height of folly, for religion is an abomination to a sinner. By this law of Lent, then, the man who is upright and perfect is not restrained, nor is he content with merely submitting to that paltry rule which the heads of the church have established for those who all the year round are involved in pleasure or business, that they may be bound by this legal requirement and forced at any rate during these days to find time for the Lord, and dedicate to him the tithe of the days of their life, all of which they would have consumed as their prophets. But the righteous, for whom the law is not appointed, and who devote to spiritual duties not a small part, namely the tenth, but the whole time of their life, because they are free from the burden of tithes according to law, for this reason, if any worthy and pious occasion happening to them constrains them, 
are ready to relax their station fast without any hesitation. For in their case it is no paltry tithe that is diminished, as they offer all that they have to the Lord equally with themselves. And this certainly a man could not do without being guilty of a grievous wrong, who, offering nothing of his own free will to God, is forced to pay his tithes by a stern compulsion of the law which takes no excuse. Wherefore it is clearly established that the servant of the law cannot be perfect, who only shuns those things which are forbidden, and does those things which are commanded, but that those are really perfect, who do not take advantage even of those things which the law allows. And in this way, though it is said of the Mosaic law that the law brought nothing to perfection, we read that some of the saints in the Old Testament were perfect, because they went beyond the commands of the law and lived under perfection of the gospel, knowing that the law is not appointed for the righteous, but for the unrighteous and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the wicked and defiled, etc. Howbeit you should know that as long as the primitive church retained its perfection unbroken, this observance of Lent did not exist, for they were not bound by the requirements of this order, or by any legal enactments, nor confined in the very narrow limits of the fast, as the fast embraced equally the whole year round. But when the multitude of believers began day by day to decline from that apostolic fervor, and to look after their own wealth, and not to portion it out for the good of all the faithful in accordance with the arrangement of the apostles, but having an eye to their own private expenses, tried not only to keep it, but actually to increase it, not content with following the example of Ananias and Sapphira, then it seemed good to all the priests that men who were hampered by worldly cares and almost ignorant, if I may say so, of abstinence and contrition, should be recalled to the pious duty by a fast canonically enjoined, and be constrained by the necessity of paying the legal tithes, as this certainly would be good for the weak brethren, and could not do any harm to the perfect, who were living under the grace of the gospel, and by their voluntary devotion going beyond the law, so as to succeed in attaining to the blessedness which the apostle speaks of. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under law, but under grace. For of a truth sin cannot exercise dominion over one who lives faithfully under the liberty of grace. Germanus Because this saying of the apostle, which promises freedom from care not only to monks, but to all Christians in general, cannot lead us wrong, it seems to us somewhat obscure. For whereas he maintains that all those who believe the gospel are at liberty and free from the yoke and dominion of sin, how is it that the dominion of sin holds vigorous sway over almost all the baptized, in accordance with the Lord's words, where he says, Everyone that doeth sin is the servant of sin. Theonas Your inquiry once more raises before us a question of no small extent the explanation of which, though I know that it cannot be taught to or understood by the inexperience, yet as far as I can I will try to set forth in words and briefly to explain, if only your minds will follow up and act upon what we say. For whatever is known not by teaching but by experience, just as it cannot be taught by one without experience, so neither can it be grasped or taken in by the mind of one who has not laid the foundation by a similar study and training. And therefore I think it necessary for us first to inquire somewhat carefully what is the purpose or meaning of the law, and what is the system and perfection of grace, and from this we may succeed in understanding the dominion of sin and how to drive it out. And so the law chiefly commands men to seek the bonds of wedlock, saying, Blessed is he that hath seed in Zion, and in house in Jerusalem. And, Cursed is the barren that hath not borne. On the other hand, grace invites us to the purity of perpetual chastity, and the undefiled state of blessed virginity, saying, Blessed are the barren, and the breasts which have not given suck. 
and he that hateth not father and mother and wife cannot be my disciple. And this of the apostle, it remaineth that they that have wives be as though they had them not. The law says, Thou shalt not delay to offer thy tithes and first fruits. Grace says, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell all that thou hast and give to the poor. The law forbids not retaliation for wrongs and vengeance for injuries, saying, An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Grace would have our patience proved by the injuries and blows offered to us being redoubled, and bids us to be ready to endure twice as much damage, saying, If a man strike thee on one cheek, offer to him the other also, and to him who will contend with thee at the law, and take away thy coat, give him thy cloak also. The one decrees that we should hate our enemies, the other that we should love them, so that it holds that even for them we ought always to pray to God. Whoever therefore climbs this height of evangelical perfection is at once raised by the merits of such virtue above every law, and disregarding as trivial all that is commanded by Moses, recognizes that he is only subject to the grace of the Saviour, by whose aid he knows that he attained to that most exalted condition. Therefore sin has no dominion over him, because the love of God, which is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is in us, shuts out all care for everything else, and can neither desire what is forbidden, or disregard what is commanded, as its whole aim and all its desire is ever fixed on divine love, and to such an extent is it not caught by the delights of worthless things, that it actually does not take advantage of those things which are permitted. But under the law, where lawful marriages are observed, although the rovings of wantonness are restrained and bound down to the one woman alone, yet the pricks of carnal lust cannot help being vigorous, and it is hard for the fire for which fuel is expressly supplied to be thus shut in within prearranged limits so as not to spread further and burn up anything it touches. As even if this objection occurs to it, that it is not allowed to be kindled beyond these limits, yet even while it is kept in check, it is on fire, because the will itself is in fault, and its habit of carnal intercourse hurries it into too speedy excesses of adultery. But those whom the grace of the Saviour has fired with the holy love of chastity so consume all the thorns of carnal desires in the fire of the Lord's love, that no dying embers of sin interfere with the coldness of their purity. The servants of the law, then, from the use of lawful things, fall away to unlawful. The partakers of grace, while they disregard lawful things, know nothing of unlawful ones. But as sin is alive in one who loves marriage, so it is also in one who is satisfied with merely paying his tithes and firstfruits. For while he is dawdling or careless, he is sure to sin in regard to either their quality or quantity, or the daily distribution of them. For as he is commanded unweirdly to minister to those in want of what is his, although he may dispense it with the fullest faith and devotion, yet it is hard for him not to fall often into the snares of sin. But over those who have not set at naught the counsel of the Lord, but who, disposing of all their property to the poor, take up their cross and follow the bestower of grace, sin can have no dominion. For no faithless anxiety for getting food will annoy him who piously distributes and disperses his wealth already consecrated to Christ, and no longer regarded as his own. Nor will any grudging hesitation take away from the cheerfulness of his almsgiving, because without any thought of his own needs, or fear of his own food running short, he is distributing what has once for all been completely offered to God, and is no longer regarded as his own, as he is sure that when he has succeeded in stripping himself as he desires, he will be fed by God much more than the birds of the air. On the other hand, he who retains his goods of this world, or bound by the rules of the old law, 
distributes the tithe of his produce and his first fruits, or a portion of his income, although he may, to a considerable degree, quench the fire of his own sins by the due of almsgiving. Yet, however generously he gives away his wealth, it is impossible for him altogether to rid himself of the dominion of sin, unless perhaps by the grace of the Saviour. Together with his substance, he gets rid of all love of possessing. In the same way, he cannot fail to be subject to the bloody sway of sin, whoever chooses to pull out, as the law commands, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, or to hate his enemy. For while he desires, by retaliation, an exchange to avenge an injury done to himself, and while he cherishes bitter hatred against an enemy, he is sure always to be inflamed with the passion of anger and rage. But whoever lives under the light of the grace of the gospel, and overcomes evil by not resisting it, but by bearing it, and does not hesitate of his own free will to give to one who smites his right cheek, the other also, and to one who wants to raise a lawsuit against him for his coat, gives his cloak also, and who loves his enemies, and prays for those who slander him. This man has broken the yoke of sin and burst its chains. For he is not living under the law, which does not destroy the seeds of sin. Whence not without reason the apostle says of it, There is a setting aside of the former commandment, because of the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law brought nothing to perfection. And the Lord says by the prophet, And I gave them commands that were not good, and ordinances whereby they could not live. But under grace which does not merely lop off the boughs of wickedness, but actually tears up the very roots of an evil will. Whoever then strives to reach the perfection of evangelical teaching, this man living under grace, is not oppressed by the dominion of sin. For to be under grace is to be those things which grace commands. But whoever will not submit himself to the complete requirements of evangelical perfection, must not remain ignorant that, although he seems to be baptized and to be a monk, yet he is not under grace, but is still shackled by the chains of the law, and weighed down by the burden of sin. For it is the aim of him who, by the grace of adoption, accepts all those by whom he has been received, not to destroy, but to build upon, not to abolish, but to fulfill the Mosaic requirements. But some knowing nothing about this, and disregarding the splendid counsels and exhortations of Christ, are so emancipated by the carelessness of a freedom too hastily assumed, that they not only fail to carry out the commands of Christ as if they were too hard, but actually scorn as antiquated the commands given to them as beginners and children by the law of Moses, saying in this dangerous freedom of theirs, that which the apostle execrates, We have sinned, because we are not under the law, but under grace. He then who is neither under grace, because he has never climbed the heights of the Lord's teaching, nor under the law, because he has not accepted even those small commands of the law, this man, ground down beneath a twofold rule of sin, fancies that he has received the grace of Christ, simply and solely for this, that by this dangerous liberty of his, he may make himself none of his, and falls into that state which the Apostle Peter warns us to avoid, saying, Act as free, and not having your liberty as a cloak of wickedness. The blessed Apostle Paul also says, For ye brethren were called to liberty, that is, that ye might be free from the dominion of sin. Only use not your liberty for an occasion for the flesh, that is, believe that the doing away with the commands of the law is a license to sin. But this liberty, the Apostle Paul teaches us, is nowhere but where the Lord is dwelling. For he says, The Lord is the Spirit, but where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Wherefore, I know not whether I could express and explain the meaning of the blessed Apostle, as those know how, who have experience. One thing I do know, that it is very clearly revealed even without anyone's explanation 
to all those who have perfectly acquired praktiki, that is, practical training. For they will need no effort to understand in discussion what they have already learnt in practice. Germanus You have very clearly explained a most difficult question, and one which, as we think, is unknown to many. Wherefore we pray you to add this also for our good, and carefully to expound why sometimes when we are fasting more strictly than usual, and are exhausted and worn out, severe bodily struggles are excited. For often on waking from sleep, when we have discovered that we have been defiled, we are so dejected in heart that we do not even venture faithfully to rise even for prayer. Theonas Your zeal indeed, whereby you desire to reach the way of perfection, not for a moment only, but fully and perfectly, urges us to continue this discussion unweariedly. For you are anxiously inquiring not about external chastity or outward circumcision, but about that which is secret, as you know that complete perfection does not consist in this visible continence of the flesh which can be attained either by constraint or by hypocrisy even by unbelievers, but in that voluntary and invisible purity of heart, which the blessed apostle describes as follows. For he is not a Jew which is so outwardly, nor is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and the circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God, who alone searches the secrets of the heart. But because it is not possible for your wish to be fully satisfied, as the short space of the night that is left is not enough for the investigation of this most difficult question, I think it well to postpone it for a while, for these matters as they should be propounded by us quietly and with a heart entirely free from all bustling thoughts, so should they be received into your minds, for just as the inquiry ought to be undertaken for the sake of our common purity, so they cannot be learnt or acquired by one who is without the gift of uprightness. For we do not ask what arguments of empty words, but what the inward faith of the conscience and the greater force of truth can persuade. And therefore, with regard to the knowledge and teaching of this purification, nothing can be brought forward except by one who has had experience of it. Nor can anything be committed except to one who is a most eager and very earnest lover of the truth itself, who does not hope to attain it by asking questions with mere vain words, but by striving with all his might and main, with no wish for useless chattering, but with the desires to purify himself internally.